Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for our Garfield Drive Improvement Project virtual meeting. Um, my name is Jessica Medina. I help out with communications for the city and I'm serving as communications manager for this project. Um, tonight we are offering Spanish language interpretation and I have Mariana Rivarola here as our interpreter and she's going to explain how to access that interpretation if you'd like to. So Mariana. Thank you, Jessica. Eh, tenemos traducción simultánea al español. A los que necesitan escuchar esta reunión pueden hacerlo seleccionando un icono que está por debajo. Si están en sus teléfonos, hay tres puntitos. Ahí pueden seleccionar español. Esta es la presentación entonces de eh, mejoría del Garfield Drive. Es un proyecto para repavimentación y otras cosas. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, thanks, Mariana. And um, next, I will introduce Gina Benedetti Petnik. Um, our Assistant Director of Public Works and Utilities. Thanks, Jessica. Um, thank you for those of you who could join us tonight and hear about this, um, this project, which we're all very excited about and ready to share with you and get some, some uh, of your thoughts on it as well. So uh, as Jessica said, I'm Assistant Director of Public Works and Utilities and this project like many others, I serve uh, in an advisory role. And uh, with that, I will in, uh, have our, uh, our project, the rest of our project team introduce themselves. So George, I'll kick it over to you. Uh, thank you, Gina. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm George Howard. I'm a assistant engineer too with the Capital Improvements Project Division in the Public Works. And uh, I'm serving as the project manager on this project. Being recorded. And uh, Bjorn, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, George. Hi, everyone. My name is Bjorn Kriepenberg. Um, I'm a project manager with uh, Public Works and Utilities, although I'm not the project manager for this project. That's George. Um, but uh, I am uh, lending um, my uh, expertise on uh, active transportation and uh, street design, along with um, some of our other uh, traffic engineers. And I think it's back to you, George, to kick us off. All right. Thank you, Bjorn. Um, can you please move to the next slide? All right, everyone. <clears throat> so uh, the purpose of this meeting is, uh, as I'm sure everyone is aware, we are currently doing some water services work on Garfield Drive. And um, I'm pretty excited to share some of this upcoming pavement work and also share some of the safety and accessibility improvements that we're including in this design. And we will also have some time for questions and uh, public comments at the end. And um, uh, ultimately, what we, the main purpose of this project is to uh, improve the safety and uh, accessibility on Garfield Drive. And We'll also be talking about the uh, next steps and kind of the timeline of the project. All right, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, the project area, we are going on Garfield Drive from East Washington Street to uh, Cross Creek, just before Cross Creek Street, Cross Creek Street, excuse me, the uh, roundabout. And this is a 1.5 mile stretch Garfield Drive is classified as a collector. And as of note, um, Garfield Drive has uh, two parks that are accessed from it. That includes Wiseman Park and Arroyo Park. And uh, not shown on screen here, but just uh, south of the project area, um, we were close to uh, Casa Grande High School. All right, next slide, please. And at this time, I would like to use this opportunity to uh, launch a poll, if you could uh, launch that, please. And we're going to be asking some uh, questions to get to know a little bit about um, the uh, residents and people who are in this meeting and um, provide some feedback. So you'll, you should see some poll questions coming up here. Number one, the first one, we would like to know, uh, what's your connection with this street, with this stretch of uh, Garfield Drive? and uh, kind of where you live. And the next question is, how do you currently use this stretch of Garfield Drive? Do you um, uh, drive, walk, jog, bike, scoot, roll, et cetera? 
And on the next slide here, do you use this route to access schools or parks? And we would like to have uh, some of this feedback just to get to better know the community and how they um, use Garfield Drive. So um, yeah, I guess so we'll take a moment here to give everyone the opportunity to uh, respond to this poll. And uh, Bjorn, we could uh, let me know uh, when you think uh, we've got our, uh, everyone's had an opportunity to uh, respond. Yeah, we'll do. We'll give them uh, a few more seconds here. Should and note can... to our to our attendees that you may have to scroll down on that poll window to get to all right. of the questions. There's a scroll bar on the and right. And questions, questions two and three are check all that apply as well. Um, not just a single option. Yeah. Looks like we've got some more people that have joined us too since the polls launched. So um, give a little bit of extra time, but welcome to anyone who is uh, just now joined us. Um, as George just said, we're, um, we've are we got a poll up on the screen just trying to uh, get to know uh, you all a little bit better and, and how you use Garfield Drive. All right, I think we can end the poll and I will share the results on the screen. All right. Jessica, are you able to grab screenshots of the results while we're showing them? Nope, you're muted, Jessica, sorry. Sorry, yes, I'm just taking a screenshot of the first question and I'll move on to the next one. So it looks like uh, for folks in attendance use uh, currently use Garfield Drive several different ways, um, walk, bike, and drive. Um, and it looks like most trips are um, home-based, few, few people travel using it to travel to and from parks. All right, Jessica, have you got those results? Uh, I do now. Thank you. Great. Thanks. All right, George, you can uh, continue. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Bjorn. And so we're going to be talking about uh, why uh, Garfield Drive was chosen for repair and um, some of the criteria that uh, we considered uh, first, this is a part of the city's water services uh, replacement program. As you know, we're doing some uh, utility work out there. And um, the basically the pavement is uh, has failed and needs to be repaired. And also Gar Garfield Drive is close and to proximity for schools and parks. And also we have a, a lot of opportunities to make the streets safer. And can we go to the next side here? All right, so I'll give everyone a little bit of background about the utility work, the water services that we're replacing on Garfield Drive. So uh, as you uh, probably are familiar with, um, there's a wear and tear over time for our underground um, system. And the city has uh, identified uh, Garfield Drive as an area that has a lot of leaks and issues. And our operations crew is called out to respond frequently to this area. Um, there are uh, some of the materials that they use for our water services are about kind of 50 to 40 years old and they are degrading and cracking a lot. So we have a water services program going on right now and there are efficiencies in the city side. And also we like to be able to um, have one project and kind of basically get out of the neighborhood as clean and quick as possible with uh, one kind of continuous construction activity as much as we can. All right, next slide, please, Bjorn. All right, so for traffic engineering, we like to use what we call the pavement condition index, also known as PCI 
to describe the quality of roads. And it's basically a sliding scale from zero to 100, with zero being failed, it's no good, and uh, 100 being a basically a newer street. And as we can see here, uh, Garfield Drive, uh, kind of on the left, you can see an example, and there is uh, alligator cracking, and those are signs of a uh, failure. And from our studies, Garfield Drive's uh, PCI ranges from the zero to uh, 15 in that project area. So it is in the failed to serious uh, range. So that makes it a good candidate for repair. And we're gonna be doing a repair method that includes addressing the, not only the top layer of asphalt, but also some of the um, foundation and sub, sub layers to uh, beef up and give us a strong, uh, strong street that should last um, a long time. All right, next slide, please. And I think uh, Bjorn, would you like to uh, take it from here? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, George. And sorry for uh, my screen share. Uh, I accidentally advanced a bunch of slides there. Um, but uh, as I'm sure many people are aware, uh, safe streets are uh, very important to the city. Um, this was included in Council's top 10 priorities, um, and it's aligned with uh, some related goals that they uh, that our Council has adopted, including achieving carbon neutrality by 2030, and also um, reducing severe injuries and deaths resulting from traffic collisions to zero by 2030. Um, the city also has a uh, complete streets policy uh, that uh, requires us to consider the needs of all road users when whenever we are designing streets, and that includes um, these paving projects. So we'll, we'll be touching on this quite a bit uh, later in the presentation, talking about the different design elements and, and getting your feedback on them. Some of the um, characteristics of Garfield Drive um, currently sees about uh, an average of about 930 vehicles per day, um, which is uh, which is fairly low uh, given that it is uh, classified as a, a collector roadway. Um, our, we have a uh, I think four or five different street classifications, and collectors are in theory the second busiest roadway behind arterials. Um, but as far as our, our collectors go throughout the city, this is one of our, actually one of the less busy um, ones. It has a 25 mile an hour uh, speed limit. Typically, we see an average of one collision per year. Um, we've seen, that's that's been the case since 2016. Fortunately, uh, almost all of those have been um, uh, have not in, resulted in injuries. Um, they've mostly been minor fender benders or um, or uh, involving solo drivers crashing into uh, parked cars or other um, objects in the roadway. Um, when you look at the corridor that we are uh, repaving between East Washington and um, Cross Creek, there are currently just two locations with marked crosswalks. And so we'll be touching on that later, all of the different places where we are uh, adding crosswalks as part of this project. Likewise, um, none of the curb ramps uh, meet uh, current uh, accessibility standards. So um, especially as you move kind of towards the west, west side of the corridor, closer to East Washington, as, as you see in the picture here, a lot of street corners don't even have curb ramps. And then moving to the east in some of the newer sections, um, there are some curb ramps, uh, although they are not um, up to current standard. And this is not currently a proposed bike route in our uh, bicycle and pedestrian master plan. That's the that's a council adopted document. It was last adopted in 2008. It's actually being updated right now. And uh, but in that last adoption in 2008, Garfield Drive was not uh, included as a proposed bike route. So we collected some data um, on, uh, I believe, five days, five weekdays, Monday through Friday uh, in October of last year. And um, uh, there's some good and some bad here. So, you know, the good is the average speed is below 20, the posted speed limit of 25 miles an hour. Um, 
unfortunately, there is a pretty high percentage of what we call enforceable violations. So those are speeds that exceed five miles an hour over the posted speed limit. So in that case, that those would be people driving over 30 miles an hour. Um, about four in every 10 drivers on Garfield is driving uh, over 30 miles an hour. The top speed was 42, which um, again, not great, but we actually have some streets where we, we see uh, much higher, what we call outlier speeds. Um, and uh, that resulted in um, the, the enforcement rating for this street and in its current conditions is, is high, meaning um, just given the, the high incidence of, of speeding. And uh, again, we'll be touching uh, shortly on um, a lot of the traffic calming and other design elements, but I'll pass it back to you, George, to quickly touch on the timeline. Thank you for that, Bjorn. So yeah, we'll take you a little bit through the timeline. We are in this uh, April 12th community meeting right now. And uh, as everyone is probably aware, we are currently ongoing in construction with a coast side concrete and construction on Garfield Drive. We are uh, anticipating to complete the work uh, immediately on Garfield Drive in uh, May. And following the completion of the utility work, we are uh, currently in signing a contract with uh, Gelati Brothers Incorporated and are anticipating to start construction in June, shortly after our utility work is complete. And this, uh, the pavement work that starts in June, we're anticipating for, for it to be complete in the fall slash winter of 2023. And also, I'd like to emphasize that we will be in contact with residents and provide a letters as, uh, as we um, kind of get closer to that date and have an official start date with the contractor. And also the contractor will be posting signs and notices as they get into construction. And next slide, please. And All right. I'm going to pass it to Bjorn. Thank you. Thanks. So um, this uh, just basically one last um, section here before we open up to your um, questions and comments, um, but we'll quickly walk through um, some of the design elements that we looked at as we were um, uh, well as we were designing this uh, the the signage and uh, and roadway markings as part of this project. So our, our goals off the top were to slow traffic. Obviously we just showed that slide with um, some some uh, some speeding issues. Um, we want to improve the accessibility on the corridor, um, especially as it relates to those curb ramps. And then we want to improve intersection safety for all road users. Um, uh, most collisions that occur throughout the city and, and on Garfield Drive do happen at intersections. And, um, and there's some really good opportunities here to, uh, to improve our intersections. As I mentioned before, you know, the absence of crosswalks being, being a, uh, a great opportunity. So the first, um, uh, design element that uh, we'll cover is uh, called intersection daylighting. Um, it's essentially it's parking prohibition uh, or red curb uh, for a, a, a given distance near intersections and crosswalks. And what that does is it um, improves sight distance. It opens up the sight lines at those uh, at intersections and crosswalks so that you can establish visibility between uh, road users. And this is especially beneficial for people who are waiting to cross or turn on to Garfield, um, uh, including, you know, and, and especially for pedestrians waiting to cross Garfield. Um, they can, they, they can, they're more visible to drivers and likewise, they can more easily see drivers. So we're proposing doing this within 10 feet of all two-way intersections and within 10 to 20 feet of our all-way stops. Next up, um, curb ramps. So um, as I mentioned, uh, none of the curb ramps on Garfield Drive uh, meet current uh, accessibility standards. And so we would be replacing all 58 curb ramps on the corridor um, to uh, meet current standard. Uh, most will look 
uh, like what you see here um, with the uh, detect what's called a detectable uh, surface. Those are, are really to aid people with visual impairments. Um, but probably the, the 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 biggest, the most universal benefit of these improved curb ramps is that they just make it a much much easier to navigate our streets and sidewalks for people um, walking, using wheelchairs, using walkers, even people walking with strollers, any sort of wheeled device. Um, it's just a much much more accessible and and pleasant experience. Next up, um, we have crosswalks and uh, bulb outs. So um, these are uh, high visibility crosswalks. You can see the, the ladder style uh, crosswalk there. Um, that's that's sort of our, our that's our city standard. Um, the one shown here is actually in yellow because it's near a school, but um, most, if not all, of the crosswalks you'll see out on Garfield would be white because they they are not within that uh, distance of a school. But um, what we we do a few things here. So we um, we install the crosswalk. We um, have we we create an area where um, basically vehicles can't uh, encroach on or um, encroach on that that daylighting uh, area where we've prohibited parking. So this is uh, doing a few things. It's shortening the the crossing distance for pedestrians. It's actually allowing you as a pedestrian you could sort of step out into the roadway without being exposed to vehicle traffic and wait for a car to stop a driver to stop for you before proceeding um and and we know that you know just narrowing the roadway down a little bit adding some uh vertical elements in the roadway is going to make drivers um drivers are going to tend to go a little bit slower they're going to drive with more caution um and it's going to slow down slow their turning movements uh as they as they make turns um so we're proposing these at all of the all-way stop locations uh, and also at the, um, the Washington Creek Trail crossing. As I mentioned before, I believe there's only two locations currently on the corridor with crosswalks. And so you would see these high visibility crosswalks and painted bulb outs at um, seven locations now. Next up, um, lane widths. So generally speaking, uh, the wider the travel lane, um, the faster people are going to drive. Uh, that's reflected in, in the speeds that we're seeing on Garfield Drive today. It's, it, it's pretty much a wide open expanse of, of pavement. Um, you don't really have, um, with the exception of the, of the yellow dashed center line that's out there today, there is really no other paint out there, um, and so the the travel lane feels the travel lanes feel very very wide to drivers, and uh, tends to encourage them to drive faster. So what we're looking at doing is actually adding edge lines to um, outside the parking lane um, and actually widening the parking lane out to ten feet to shrink that two way um, the the two travel lanes down to ten feet each. And we would actually eliminate the center, the yellow center line, which is um, aimed at creating a little bit more friction between drivers. Um, when you remove that center line and push the two lanes a little closer together, drivers are going to um, just naturally slow down as they approach oncoming traffic because they won't be quite as confident that they can um, safely clear oncoming traffic, especially if they're driving faster. And so some feedback we received uh, as we were going to council with this item to award the construction contract, there was some interest in um, actually designating Garfield Drive as a bike route. And so I mentioned earlier in our bicycle and pedestrian master plan from 2008, Garfield Drive was not identified as a bike route, um, but it is something that we could, um, we, we are open to exploring and that we can implement through this project um, you know when you whenever you repave a roadway it's really a blank canvas you can stripe it um, however you want uh, um, given you know community engagement and uh, that it meets all of our um, design standards and best practices but uh, there's essentially there would be two options we could look at with uh, with Garfield Drive if we were to make it a, a bikeway uh, the option on the top would be 
identical to what I showed on the previous slide with our current proposed configuration. Um, two 10 foot parking lanes, a solid white uh, edge line um, delineating, separating the parking lane from the travel lane. And then um, the only addition to this would be uh, what are called sharrows. Those are those um, bike icons with the two chevrons. And what those do is they indicate uh, to drivers that there will be um, uh, that bike that people biking are entitled full use of the vehicle lane. Um, and so the expectation there on, on streets like uh, in a configuration like this, where we don't have a designated bike lane, the um, the idea is that people on bikes use the full lane and that people driving are then expected to wait and either stay behind people biking or wait behind them until there's an opportunity to safely pass by changing lanes. Um, the option on the bottom is uh, is a little bit different. It's um, this would include six foot bike designated bike lanes in both directions. But because of the width of the roadway, we would have to remove parking in one direction. So in that configuration on the bottom, you would have parking only on one side of the street. And again, bike lanes and travel lanes in both directions. Um, I will say based on um, the guidance that we have uh, around um, what types of bikeways are appropriate for people of all ages and abilities, um, what we do is we look at um, the traffic volume and the traffic speed, as well as the peak hour volume. So really what you're looking at is how exposed are um, people on bikes to vehicle traffic. And then um, the guidance will recommend what type of bike facility is appropriate based on those characteristics. For Garfield Drive, the guidance tells us that the option on the top would should be sufficient because the um, especially because the volume is is so low on Garfield. Um, the uh, you know we're obviously hopeful that um, the vehicle speeds would come down a bit with this project, and that would. Um, uh, especially kind of reinforce the suitability of, of, uh, of a class three shared lane facility on this corridor. But we do have a poll question that gets to all of this. So I will, I'll leave this slide up and then um, I'm going to launch our second poll question, which is um, what type of bikeway do you prefer for Garfield Drive? Um, and we've got a few options here. Um, the shared lanes, that's the, the option on the top, very similar to the current um, proposed configuration, but with a little bit of additional um, uh, signage and, and roadway markings. Um, the class two bike lane option on the bottom would again involve removal of parking on one side. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, so we've got, and then we've also got an option to say, don't think it should be a designated bike route, or if you're unsure, um, that's also an option. All right. Looks like the responses have stopped coming in, so I will share the results here. And looks like um, the majority of people feel that the shared lane option uh, shown on the top there would be preferable, which is very helpful. Um, Jessica, could you grab a screenshot of that? Yep, I got it. Great. And we plan to um, also engage our pedestrian and bicycle advisory committee um, on, on this topic. All right, that's it from me. Um, and I'll um, I believe I'm passing it to Jessica now to um, kick us off with questions and comments. Hi, everybody. Okay, we've reached the questions and comments portion of our evening. So um, here are some instructions on the screen for how how to comment. And I think this is 
would like to make a comment, please do the following. Yeah, raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you're participating by phone. So, so far I see two hands raised and then I'll call on you. Um, and we're not setting a time limit for questions or comments, but I would just encourage you to be respectful of everyone's evening and that, you know, I'm sure everybody wants to get, get back to their nights, but take the time you need. Um, just maybe try and keep it under three minutes if possible. And we'll start with A. Gaylord. I'm going to allow you to talk now. And Bjorn, I think we can take down this uh, questions and the share screen. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can Hi. hear you. Hi, this is Ali Gaylord. Um, thanks so much to you all for um, the great presentation. I really appreciate being walked through the, um, the plan here. Um, and I think um, this is all great. And I think it's really great that um, you're open to examining um, bike facilities. So I really appreciate that. Um, I did want to ask, um, you know, the I like the addition of the crosswalk uh, at the major intersection. But I did want to ask, there are a number of kind of like three-way T intersections uh, in this project area. I'm just wondering, um, you know, how people would be crossing there. I'm not sure if there'll be curb ramps at those locations um, right now. They're kind of, they're really hard to cross because they're they're all kind of like that rounded. They're not, they're not a true T intersection. The sidewalks are all kind of rounded and they're really hard to get a stroller or whatever off of the side of those sidewalks. Um, and the visibility can be kind of bad because you're kind of crossing into somebody's driveway if you're trying to cross, um, but there's not really a place to put uh, curb ramp. So just, I, I don't know if that's contemplated or not, but I just wanted to bring that part up. Um, and I also wanted to ask about um, kind of evaluation of this. Will will this project be evaluated? I think it could be a really good um, kind of test piece for a lot of other streets in Petaluma that are really wide like this um, and could be useful to know, like, does this help? Or does this get some use? Um, and just use it as kind of an educational um, demarcation. But I think those are my only comments for now. Um, I don't know if we're limited, uh, if somebody else says something, I think of something else, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to comment again, but. You you are allowed. You're okay. welcome, just raise the hand. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, let's see. Next we have Eve. Eve, I'm gonna allow oh, you to- Oh, sorry, Jessica, can we- Oh, um, oh I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, let's respond to- yeah, I, I just wanted to um, maybe ask Ali for some uh, clarification if you feel that there, there are any um, other intersections that come to mind where a crosswalk would be uh, beneficial other than the um, other than the always stop intersections. And what we did was we, we looked at the, the connectivity um, for the streets to the really to the north and south of, um, of Garfield and tried to figure out sort of where people would most likely be walking um, or crossing. And, uh, and that's really how we arrived at the, at the locations we did. Uh, that being said, um, if there are other locations where um, there's, a, there's a, you know, definitely some, some need for a crosswalk, um, that would be great to know. Um, and then as for the curb ramps, we do have those going in at every single street corner, um, regardless of whether it's an all-way stop or a two-way stop. Um, and I'm trying to think if there was, sorry, if I'm, oh, and then on the evaluation piece, yes, we, um, we are, um, our department is definitely trying to collect uh, a lot of data for each of our roadway projects so that we can um, learn from the different designs that we are implementing and, um, continue to improve our street design uh, as we, uh, with, with future projects. Great, thanks. Um, I think the, the one that comes to mind, uh, the T intersection that comes to mind is Parkland Way. Um, so that's um, a way that people use to get to the um, airport walking trail a lot. Um, and that one, that one's like a T intersection and it's, it's got those kind of rounded corners. Um, that I was thinking about. And I can't remember if this delay is the same 
way or not, but um, Parkland has a lot of people that go across. And then one other trouble spot that I actually just thought of when um, when you're talking about the curb ramp is um, on Appaloosa Circle, there's a, it looks like a very informal but really well used um, cut through kind of to that um, park trail. And right now it's just like a piece of plywood that somebody put down and painted red to make a ramp to it. I'm, I'm guessing that's not city sanctioned. Um, there's no sidewalk there, but if there is some way to make some sort of a ramp, I think that would be um, really helpful to people. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. we'll make a note of that. Um, that ramp is outside of the um, the limits of this project, but um, I just I just pulled it up on Street View and I'm and I'm looking at it and, and see what you mean. That is a um, uh, an interesting uh, stretch there with the fence and the bushes and <laughs> yeah, it's not the most inviting. <laughs> yeah, um, great. Well, thank you for that. I'm I'm definitely making a note of that, especially um, I'm the project manager for the active transportation plan, which is our update of the bicycle pedestrian master plan and. These are the types of um, little, uh, we're, we're making notes of all of the different um, trail access improvements that are needed throughout the city. And, and this definitely uh, qualifies. <laughs> so Thank thanks you. for that. <clears throat> okay, thanks Sally, thanks Bjorn. Uh, so next we have Eve. Eve, you should be able to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, thank you also. I wanna thank you for taking the time to do this presentation and, and give us some very valuable information as to your thought process and why our street is being chosen to be paved. I'm very happy <laughs> um, about it. I do, my biggest um, concern, uh, you alluded to it and it's the speed. So we live between Caulfield and Meadowview. And um, our street, as you may or may not be aware, is a side street that all the high schoolers use to drive down, both to get to Casa and come home from Casa. From Meadowview to Caulfield, it's a speedway. You know, they gun it from Meadowview um, until they get to uh, Caulfield. So I have two questions several questions related to that issue, which is when you guys evaluated speed, maybe you can fill us in on, on how you did that. I don't remember there being wires across the road. I'm just curious. Um, when you talk about that road, well, I want class three instead of the street. Um, however, when you talk about narrowing the roadway and not having a divider line, I have um, experienced uh, people speeding past me while I'm trying to get into my car and I have to flatten myself against my car. I've had people physically pass me on Garfield as I'm trying to slow down to park in my house. So I'm a little concerned that there isn't a line in the middle of the road, especially for, for those two reasons, but also all these students driving down the road and I'm not sure how many of them would know how to behave when there is not a line in the middle of the road. Would they then use it as a speedway? Oh, look, there's no, I don't have to stay on my side of the road. There's no car coming. Let me just go for it. So related to all this, I'm wondering if you guys have considered, uh, we were in Reno, I don't know what they're called. You're the traffic people, but they had these little things that they put in the middle of the road uh, where they forced you to slow down to go around that object in the middle of the road. And we would love to have those. We have lived in this house for 27 years and um, it has been a challenge to constantly call the police to have them come and patrol the speed of this stretch of roadway. So maybe you could speak to that. Thanks, Eve. Um... Yeah, as far as, uh, so uh, I'll just try to respond to um, a few different things there. Um, for the experience of, um, of having uh, vehicles kind of buzz you as you're getting in or out of your parked car, um, you know, our current proposed design would actually um, give you a, a, a couple of feet of buffer between 
True. parked car and the travel lane. We've got uh, we're widening the parking lane out to about ten feet, right, with our current uh, design. Um, as for the the center line question, so the reason that uh, center lines um, are uh, removing center lines can actually um, result in slowing traffic is that um, when drivers see a center line, they sort of feel ownership of that space. Um, and then when you take that center line away, uh, there's a little less certainty that you can, um, especially if there's oncoming traffic, that you can um, you know, sort of hog the roadway and, and, and go fast. Um, that being said, nothing we're doing here uh, would preclude adding a center line in the future. Um, this is a, a design that we are um, starting to roll out on streets like Garfield. And um, if we start seeing that it's not having its intended effect um, and that people are, are still speeding, um, and then we, we can definitely come back in and, and add the center line. Um, we're, you know, this, this proposal to remove the center line is really based on our research of, of uh, best practices for streets like Garfield. Um, and then as for the, the, so what you saw in Reno, those are actually called um, chicanes. And those are uh, a tool that we are, are very interested in uh, starting to use in Petaluma. We haven't actually rolled any out yet, um, but we, that's something we can definitely take a look at um, for this corridor. With any sort of traffic calming elements like that, we do always have to um, uh, work closely with our our fire department to make sure that um, we're not essentially in, impeding uh, their emergency response times. But um, our fire department's great to work with, and they've been very receptive to different traffic calming measures. Um, so yeah, that's that's something we can definitely look at. One one thing I am curious about is um, whether there's a certain stretch of Garfield. Uh, where that is especially prone to that high school related cut through traffic. Um, in an ideal world, uh, those drivers, uh, you know, Garfield really isn't meant to be a through street for um, uh, people that should instead be driving on Eli Boulevard. Um, so so you, it goes basically from Cross Creek from that roundabout all the way down to um, Caulfield. Then they hang a left on Caulfield and go the back streets till they can get back on Eli. So whatever that street is that's hmm. well to Eli Bordeaux or something like that, or one of those, they go down a little bit that way and then they hang a left and get onto Eli. It's all because of the four-way traffic stop at Caulfield and Eli um, is a nightmare. Um, so, okay. you know, yeah. don't have to around it. And that's that's really helpful to know. We are we are looking at um, improvements to um, to Caulfield that would include that that Eli intersection. Um, yeah. do, definitely know that that's a <laughs> a problematic intersection with the the multi lane all way stop. Um, uh, so that's helpful. Um, and yeah, we can definitely uh, take a closer look at that stretch and the and the the cut through traffic. Um, I, I just yeah. want to add one little detail to looking at this stretch. This part of Garfield that I live on between Meadowview and Caulfield is unusually straight. If you look at the other parts of, of Garfield, the students, it's just not that straight. And then just one other question for clarification, if you could explain to us, I'm wondering how many people are in this poll and how you'll be using this information. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, what do we have, Jessica? We had about well, we have, we have we have twelve attendees, and it looks like between seven and eight people answered each poll question. And as far as how it will be used, um, Bjorn, can you speak to that? Yeah, we're really um, so the only the only uh, question with with real design implications was the question about um, the the bike facility. So we are. Um, uh, you know, there was pretty pretty strong consensus here that uh, the class three shared lane uh, option was preferable for this for Garfield, and um, so that's something that we will take back to our um, pedestrian and bicycle advisory committee and, and get their feedback as well. 
and then um and ultimately um then then make a decision on uh what what seems appropriate for the corridor um if if we were to go the route of uh bike lanes which seems very unlikely um we would obviously re-engage the neighborhood as that would have major uh implications um with with parking removal but given the feedback we we've heard tonight and what we already know about Garfield Drive that seems extremely unlikely Jean, I saw you unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I was just going to add, I'm not sure if this was a concern of Eve's, but I just want to let her know that the poll, uh, the polls are anonymous. And just if you're concerned about privacy issues, uh, we at the at the uh, at, at some point at toward the end of our community outreach um, process. Um, uh, after we go to our pedestrian bicycle advisory committee and we talk to you all and we uh, we have online comments that will come in, we'll summarize those. And if we publish anything, we will publish sort of a, a, um, a high level summary of information and, and the tenor of what we've learned from the community. Um, if that, I don't know if that was part of your concern, but thought I should address it while we're on it. I appreciate it. it wasn't it was more and I'm trying to understand how many people's opinions are feeding into this process and if there will be another opportunity for more people in the neighborhood to to weigh in. Yeah, but thank you. I appreciate that's, that. That's a great question. And and when this goes to our bicycle advisory committee, pedestrian bicycle advisory committee, we call it PBAC, the acronym. Uh, that is a that is a public meeting and it's uh, that that will be open to the community and that's um, that's um, posted in advance uh, on the city's website about a week in advance you can find the PBAC agendas and uh, and you know uh, find out the timing on that and attend that and then in additionally comments are always welcome directed to at the end of this uh the end of the slideshow and I think again at the end of our of our meeting here uh, our project managers contact information George's contact information is available so you can always call or email uh, George Howard at cityofpetaluma.org mm -hmm. um, and uh, 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 if there's something specific to active transportation is also a great go-to and on our website there's an opportunity I believe to provide input on the website and Jessica can speak to that for us. So yeah. lots of ways to keep to keep information flowing so that we can hear from as many people as possible. That's what that's what our interest is. Yeah, so in regard to the website, Gina, there is a sign up form on the web page. It's cityofpetaluma.org forward slash Garfield paving. So you can go there um, to sign up for project updates and there's also a box to leave comments so that's one place people can do it um another thing we could do if everybody from this meeting goes to sign up for updates and we've also um, put it out to the community to sign up for project updates then we can send a dedicated email to everyone who signed up in advance of the PBAC meeting just to say hey we're going to be talking about this at PBAC like come join if you'd like to have your voice heard something along those lines um, I know Bjorn and I have done that for, for other meetings, so we'd be happy to do that for this as well. All right. Uh, anything else for Eve, or should we move to the next? I'm great. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Okay, next we have Dana. Dana, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, where'd you go? There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Thank you also. I just have a, a question. It seems like after we've done a lot of work and put in new, new streets, et cetera, as soon as everything is really pretty, Comcast or AT&T or somebody comes along and digs up the street for their needs, is there a way to validate that everybody who needs to dig up the street have done their digging before we make it pretty? Yeah, so um, I'd like to speak to that. So um, when we uh, do a uh, paving on a road, uh, there is a moratorium that's a kind of five-year, basically, um, 
we don't want to have any utilities come and tear up a freshly paved uh, surface that and the city also has um, utility coordination meetings where we um, coordinate and talk about some of the work that we're doing and uh, we have talked about um, our uh, work on Garfield Drive at those meetings and um, we uh, do the best we can to outreach with uh, the various uh, utility companies and let them know that we're doing work here and um, yeah, if uh, anyone has anything else they'd like to add. Yeah, I, I would love to chime in. Dana, it's a, it's a great question. It's super frustrating for us too when that happens. It can happen. Uh, sometimes there's emergency work that's just where the utility isn't anticipating it for some reason. Uh, they demonstrate that there truly is an emergency. And at, at that point, we have to let them go in there. But when they do, they're required to do um, a, a very thorough restoration of the areas that they disturb. And I think, I think our team in Public Works is doing a better job of taking care of this uh, than maybe we did several years ago. Um, but welcome the feedback on that. If you think that, it, it, you know, if there's some areas that you've seen that just drive you crazy because you've witnessed something that seems, um, seems wrong uh, as far as a, a post paving disruption, uh, we'd love to hear about it and like to hear your concerns for sure. Uh, we, do, we do our best to avoid it. it, it everything George said is spot on, but, um, but sometimes humans get in the way ourselves included. <laughs> I've not seen it in Petaluma, but I've seen it elsewhere where I've lived. And I would hate to see after we go through all this to have it happen here. Yeah, well, we all agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. We're doing our best to avoid that very thing. I appreciate this, uh, this outreach, it's wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Dana. Um, next, we have Tom. Tom, I'm gonna allow you to talk now so you should be able to can you hear us yes my wife vivian yeah hi hi vivian uh, hi tom hi. thank you for doing this um we are in 100 percent agreement with eve and we live on the other side we know where eve lives so we're on the other side of village east towards cross creek and the traffic and the kids coming from the school it, they're going well over 40 miles an hour sometimes mm -hmm. it's it's bad so and then I have concerns with the no striping down the middle of the of the road because I think those kids will go ahead and just take over the whole lane they won't have any We've seen it yeah we have seen it and they won't have any care about who's where and then another question I have is um, are you guys going to think about putting another roundabout in any of those intersections? And then there's another one. Um, if the Garfield is not on the docket to put bike route or lanes, why are we even discussing that? All right. Thanks, uh, Vivian and Tom. I believe I can. Uh, take most of those questions, or at least try to. Um, I'll I'll go in reverse order because I can remember your last question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, yeah, that was just some feedback we got from um, as we were going to council to award this construction contract a few weeks ago. Um, some feedback from the public that um, this should be considered as a as a bike route, given. Uh, that it is a, a, a parallel alternative to riding on um, Eli Boulevard, which understandably is uh, not a very comfortable experience given how busy it is. And um, so we actually have access to um, a, a tool, a, a heat map that shows where people uh, ride their bikes. And um, uh, it's based on a, a, a popular exercise uh, mobile app called Strava. Um, but um, so we Strava provides governments with aggregated data so that we can kind of to better inform our efforts to to make uh, street improvements. And um, so when we, we took a look at that and did see that there is a, a fairly high uh, level of bike activity on Garfield Drive. And um, so we just 
we wanted to, you know, this is the, a great opportunity. Like I said, when we, when we repave a street, it's really a blank canvas. So we wanted, this was a great opportunity to explore that question and um, just wanted to, to get additional feedback on, um, on whether we should designate it as a bike route. Um, for roundabouts, we do not have any uh, newly proposed roundabouts. Um, there's just the one over at um, Cross Creek. Uh, that being said, um, the city has added um, traffic circles to our, our repertoire. And if, um, if, if any of those um, always stops seem like a, a good candidate, to receive a traffic circle, that's something we can definitely explore. Um, and then I'm going thinking back to your other questions uh, for the center line. Um, you know, just to reiterate, so the reason we're proposing that is is really based on our research of, of best practices and what um, other cities have experienced when they've removed the center line on on streets like uh, Garfield. Uh, that being said, we will definitely watch this very closely and. Yeah. Um, and and we'll keep uh, you know please please reach out to us if you're seeing uh, issues. But we'd love to at least start with this um, this design, see how it works. Mm -hmm. We think it will deliver some traffic calming benefits. And um, but if it doesn't, we can we can come back and we can add the center line yeah, back right. in. You can rent um, a house here during the school time, and you can see for yourself. Yeah, what it's like. all it's you got to do is is come by three o'clock in the afternoon and see how fast these kids are driving. Yeah, we, it's, it's not good. I, none of us doubt what you're telling us, and and we we see this on other corridors in town, so mm -hmm. it's not it's not new to us. Yeah, um, and and it's not safe we're trying to we're trying to fix some of this and yeah. and what bjorn has described by removing that that center marking is um is a pretty standard tried and true methodology that's used uh it's a it's a technique used throughout the u.s and it has been used with great success that said i don't know if they ever tested it just on teens <laughs> <laughs> what you all are pointing out is that yeah. it's these outlier speeds are are teens on a on a cut yes. through. Um, yeah. and, and I was just gonna say Bjorn, it, it might be that much more of a of a uh, an impetus to really explore some chicanes because then you get the center line and you get some disruption to that mm -hmm. runway effect and and um, I, drivers of all ages will have to respect that, I think, yeah. or, or yeah. will be more inclined to. So, you know, I, I think they're all really good comments. We're taking them to heart. We don't, uh, you know, until we look into it a little further and explore this, you know, I don't know that we have the best answer, but, but I do want to emphasize another point that Bjorn made, and that is that what we're talking about is paint on the pavement, and it's not concrete. And, at least right now, if we did chicanes, we would do a quick build version of chicanes, I assume, to test it mm -hmm. and treat it as a little demonstration project. Uh, we would monitor it. We would check speeds before and after we, you know, we get gather data and, and see how it's performing. And, yeah. um, and it's, again, it would be the type of installation that could be undone if we needed it to or could be modified or refined if we needed it to, if we felt like, yeah, it's helping, but we could do better now that we've seen it in action. And mm -hmm. that's that's a, a way that's something that we do with what we call quick build projects. And mm -hmm. we could incorporate that feature, I think, uh, potentially into this. So we'll, we'll look, uh, I'll promise that we'll look into it for sure and explore that uh, okay. and run it to the ground one way or the other. No I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I have I have one more question. Okay. We have one, two more questions okay. actually. <laughs> Do you know which end you're going to start doing the pavement on East Washington side or on Cross Creek side? You don't know. No. Yeah. Okay. You know that jury's out on that. It, that's something that you know as we get closer to start of construction and we're working and coordinating with the contractor, we'll have a better idea. And and George, we would be providing and and Jessica, we would. Be mm -hmm. providing that information to the neighborhood once oh. we uh, once we know it got it okay and how yeah, and that's right Jessica, yes, how do we share that information when when we have that is that just on the web do they have to go find it on the website yeah so well with larger 
projects like McDowell will do periodic updates to say, you know, where the work is progressing to and from. Mm -hmm. But for something like this, I think we could put it on the website. We could also, for anybody who signed up, do a dedicated email. And we also do um, or have done in the past and could do here like a postcard prior to construction mm -hmm. starting to give to tell the story of what's happening. So just a local postcard to the neighborhood or and or door hangers. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm planning on uh, providing a letter once I uh, secure a start date from the contractor as soon as I get that information. And uh, also there'll be, um, as uh, we get close to construction, the contractor will be posting signs about when to expect and um, expect construction activities. And they'll be um, providing notices uh, as we get closer to a uh, start date. Okay. Yeah. I have just one more question. Um, we live on the corner of a Royal Park and there's a house across the street that's got some junipers and you cannot see around the corner. So the people, when they come to the stop sign at Village East and Garfield have to go way beyond the stop sign line. Mm. I've seen so many people almost crash there. Um, are you gonna do anything? I know you, you're gonna put um, red, curbs like 10 feet back um i'm just wondering if you're going to ask those people to cut back all you got to do is come and see it and try and look down garfield to uh, cross creek and so, yeah we're, we're taking i'm taking a note and i see george is taking note of this we may not even wait for the project on something like that or community enforcement officer can go out and have a little chat. And, and my my concern is, in fact, I see two kids walking on the that side of the street right now to the park and people don't stop at that sign. And you've got those junipers and it's just going to take that one time where a little kid is going to get killed. Yeah. And um, it should be addressed. They do try and maintain it, yeah. but you cannot see it. All you got to do is drive there and then you'll see you got to, you almost have to have a car length past the stop line to even see what's coming down the street and that happened to me last week turn because we right past that stop sign there's our driveway and i didn't see the car coming i slammed my brakes on and it's all because of those junipers so that's just something you might want to think about doing too just so yeah, we, yeah thank thanks for bringing that to our attention yeah G george i can get you I, if you're not sure who deals with that i can put you in touch we've got a couple of folks that w that just do and deal with that kind of thing where we have vegetation on private property it's grown out onto public property and it's and it's creating a safety hazard it is something. a safety hazard yeah. Yeah. yeah well thank you for your time thank yeah. you gina yeah i would love love to get that information and um uh, could you please uh, clarify again the uh, uh location it's Village East Drive and, and Garfield. Stop sign right there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it looks, I'm looking at Street View, George. Looks like it's right across right across from Royal Park yes. on the yeah. um, west side of, yeah. Okay, okay. I know what you're talking about. Thank you, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. I think we are ready to move on to our next hand, which is Sherry. Sherry, I'm going to allow you to talk. Thank you so much. Um, funny, Tom and Vivian are my next door neighbor and much of what they said. So hi, Tom and Vivian. Um, much of what they brought up and what Eve brought up um, are my concerns. So I'll just kind of run through. So definitely with Eve and Vivian talking about the speeding from Cross Creek all the way to Meadowview. So my driveway, I'll just tell you my address. I have no shame. I'm 1009 Garfield. Village East basically dead ends in my driveway. So I am that perfect house at like this collision course of what's happening. And so very similar for me to back out of my driveway to get onto Garfield and go anywhere is very hazardous because of speed. And it's not even just the Casa High School kids. For me, it's a pretty much any time I try to leave. I really have to be very cautious. So that that speeding thing is a real thing. And I don't even want to pin it just on the Casa kids. Like, 
Eve talked about how just trying to get into her own driveway, people honk and go around her into impeding traffic, right? Like that's a very real situation. So just know that that's still a concern. There was discussion about potential crosswalks. So currently on the corner of Garfield and Village East where we're talking about that dangerous intersection, there is no crosswalk. So for kids to get to the park and families, I almost think that's a crosswalk potential to look at. And even like an artery, like where Rogers Lane is, it's on the outskirts of where a Royal Park begins, kind of in like that open land section. I look at that as an artery because that's where everybody from the cul-de-sacs along Hidden Valley and Allen, that's their entry point to that park area. So maybe considering crosswalks in either or maybe both of those two locations. And then I guess I just have more of a question of could there be a collaboration with CASA as an educational standpoint of like, hey, we get you want to cut through, you're trying to save time, but here are some concerns. Let's collaborate and come up with some agreements. So rather than talking about removing the center divide or the center striping or talking about putting these chicanes in, could it start as an educational process in collaboration with the students and the leadership at CASA? All right, uh, I would like to uh, respond and um, thank you for the comments on a crosswalk at either a Village East Drive or a Rogers Lane. I think that is a, a very good uh, recommendation and I'll be uh, uh, looking at uh, incorporating that into our project. Thank you. Yeah, and then um, maybe a Bjorn be able to help with that uh, second I, part I or CASA yeah. or the education. Too, okay, Bjorn, thank, like. thank you. Take a stab, Gina. No. Yeah, so um, one of our, our senior traffic engineer, Ken Eichstead, who couldn't be with us tonight, spends um, a lot of time working with our school districts and our schools uh, on each of their specific um, traffic concerns and issues and safety uh, items related to kids' access to the schools. And, and I think... Uh, uh, it, it would so in other words we're already engaged in conversation with with the high school on other traffic questions and this would be absolutely an opportunity um, to talk to them uh, about this area and and explore this I can't speak for the for the school uh, district or for the school administration but in general I can say that uh, we've always found them to be super cooperative and and engaged and wanting to help us help them. So in that vein, I, I would think that uh, you know some outreach to the high school would would um, probably be fruitful. And uh, we'll we'll relay this conversation back to Ken Eichstadt and ask him if he will um, if he will start that conversation. And. And you know, I, I don't want to diminish the the power that your community has to do the same thing. There's absolutely nothing to prevent you. And in fact, it might even be more powerful if the neighborhood were to approach the school, uh, you know, with with this um, with this concern and this interest in in working through and you know problem solving together on this. So um, absolutely. Um, you know, you can you can take a lead role in this as well. And I'll I'll just add that one of the real challenges that we have with um, with schools is is turnover, right? Um, you get new new drivers at Casa Grande every single year, and that requires the need to re-engage new drivers every year on um, on safe driving. And um, uh, so, from our you know our standpoint at the city. Um, it's it's never an either or, right? We do we need infrastructure improvements and we need education, um, but but our really what we we have more control over is how our streets are designed, and that's that's why we start with the infrastructure piece, um, and, and we also you know that that's just that's reaching everyone, right? That once a street is designed a certain way, it's designed that way 
24 seven, 365, you know, whether students are driving or not. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's kind of why we're approaching this from that, that standpoint. Um, but it's, it's, this is really helpful feedback, especially with the cut through issues. I have to say, you know, we did, we, we have the speed data, um, but I don't think we were as aware, about, uh, we were aware about the extent of the cut through traffic that's happening uh, related to the high school. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And I loved your idea, Gina, of just us as a community getting in contact with the school and just find out what's possible to open up the dialogue. And you're, yes, you're absolutely right. There's a high turnover rate of new drivers. And I don't even know how to tackle that piece of it, but at least we could let the concern be known, right? And so just thank you for that. Um, my only last question is, um, I did not have the benefit of dragging my husband to attend. I'm curious if the slides could be made available or like a PDF version could be posted so that he can kind of get the same education so that it's easier for me to relay the information to him. That would be lovely or even just other neighbors who didn't come. I'm sad that only 12 of us showed up out of the massive number of homes on Garfield Drive. Um, but I do think sharing the slides for people to preview and even maybe on the next mail out, like saying like, you could view the slides here, right? Just so that they know that information was shared um, and they, they have the same rights to it as the 12 of us who showed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, Sherry. We will make the presentation available on the project webpage, and we'll also post a recording of this webinar there. So um, if anybody would, would like to watch it who wasn't able to attend, they'll be able to do so. And, awesome. Um, yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And um, I am one of the people who you tracked on Strava using their bike <laughs> up and down Garfield for the various reasons that you said about Eli being just really busy. Like for me, that is a cut through. So I'm actually really excited to hear that information because I don't actually know other than for my own benefit of exercise, what Strava was able to do. So thank you for sharing how you know the information you know, because I think that was really incredible to hear because I had no idea. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Sherry. And then um, Dana, I see that your hand is up. I don't know if it's from before, if you raised it again, but I'm gonna allow you to talk. Oops, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't unraise it. Thanks you guys, it's been a great meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you. And did we, sorry, I just, I just missed something. Did we, uh, say um, where um, where they can find a copy of the uh, PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah, it'll be posted to the project webpage along with the recording of this meeting, and um, we can look for that by the end of the week. Thanks. And again, it's cityofpetaluma.org forward slash Garfield paving. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, thank you. like that's the oh eve yeah I'm, oh wait eve i see eve's hand come eve you there hi again sorry hi. quick question for you um hold on a second um i appreciate your qualifying that this is a paving project and a street project so the issues of speeding are perhaps not entirely addressed by this can you point me in the right direction as to who I would need to talk to about possibly putting in cameras to issue tickets? I don't know if the city does that, but. I can actually, I can take that one. Um, so unfortunately in California, um, we're speed cameras are not um, uh, legally, uh, they're not legal in California. Um, uh, there was a time when red light running cameras were, uh, those are actually legal in California, but, um, and there was a time that they were, they were used and, and they've sort of fallen out of practice uh, due to high administration costs. Um, there are some efforts at the state level right now to, um, 
to pilot speed cameras in a handful of, of cities, including, I believe, San Francisco and San Jose. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, but as far as uh, other uh, traffic calming or um, speed enforcement uh, efforts, um, you can always reach out to us directly. Um, so you can reach out to police to request um, uh, speed enforcement. You can reach out to Public Works to request physical improvements to the street that might slow traffic. Um, we're actually getting ready to launch in the in the next month or two uh, a new program that would basically streamline this process so that all of the speeding related requests are going to one centralized place and then being shared with both police and public works. Right now, it's just being done by um, sort of by word of mouth. They share what they get, we share what we get, um, but we're going to be uh, revamping that process and actually um, creating a, uh, a, a scoring system through which we'll evaluate all of the requests we get and uh, implement projects um, sort of but prioritize and implement projects uh, based on our available funding. So um, stay tuned for more on that on the city's website. But um, in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to us or to police. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Eve. Thanks, Bjorn. And Allie, I see your hand up again. Hi there. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. the, right when you guys thought it was ending, but I just felt I would be um, remiss in, in my thinking or my duties if I didn't mention just the walking environment um, on Garfield. I know the sidewalks are not part of the scope of this project, but there are very narrow sidewalks, very um, kind of bad shaped sidewalk uh, concrete. Um, so I just wanted to mention that that, that could supposed to be widened. They're, they're super narrow. It's hard for me just to walk my dog uh, on them, let alone walking by somebody. Um, and there's no street trees, especially up near the um, East Washington side. So I just wanted to put a plug in if there are any thoughts about doing additional traffic calming. Um, maybe there could be some of those street tree islands that could be put in um, every so often. I know that would potentially take up a parking space or two, um, but just something to make the environment a little bit more hospitable. You know, if you go to some of the subdivisions that are just across East Washington, you see a ton more trees, but these subdivisions uh, by and large were built a long time ago and there were no street tree requirements and just the, um, the pedestrian experience could be a lot better. And I think um, having the trees could, could accomplish some of this traffic calming that a lot of the neighbors have been talking about because I think we've all seen cars speeding or, you know, and it's really dangerous. And I know a lot of people talked about the after school time, but the before school time is really dangerous too, especially when the sun's low in the sky, the sun's just coming up and you're trying to cross the street. People are getting that glare in their windshield and not, you know, even if they're not intending to see it or not intending to do anything, they just, they can't see. So, um, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ali. I'd like to uh, respond about uh, the um, sidewalk. So um, I, uh, as part of this project, uh, we will be going through and um, areas that are of uh, trip hazards and have uh, uplift. Um, uh, out, we will be uh, replacing um, some of the poor condition sidewalk. Uh, we are not uh, currently looking at adding any um, uh, widths to the sidewalk and um, um, maybe uh, Gina could uh help me out there on kind of if uh considering um expanding the widths of the sidewalks oh you're muted gina oh, that is a real so. tough one um yeah for, it's a tough nut to crack because it's very expensive um we actually have brought from what i can see we probably could add a foot or two in terms of right of way right bjorn the issue really is budget and and cost, um, the sorts of, of things that we've been talking about being able to add and adjust, et cetera, are relatively low cost improvements because they're paint or signage or removable items, um, bollards sometimes. Um, so uh, doing concrete work is huge. Um, it usually will affect um, drainage and inlets as well as the curb ramps um and uh and and it isn't and, and new curb and gutter it 
probably doubles the cost, doubles, maybe more the cost of the project. That's not something I'm afraid that's, that's um, gonna be feasible at this point um, for this project. Um, but um, George, I'm glad that you pointed out that we are gonna be looking at areas of sidewalk that are badly damaged and that are causing safety issues and trip hazards and access problems. And we can repair those, um, but widening the sidewalk is probably not gonna be an option, I'm afraid. I would love to say we could, but I just am not seeing it. Um, and then as far as um, street trees on pavement islands, um, again, it, that's something that I'd love to be able to do in more places. Um, it is, again, a drainage um, uh, complication. When you do these, you have to, you still have to drain um, uh, stormwater uh, at the curb and, and, um, and you have to have amendments. You have to have, you know, enough enough of an island there to keep a tree healthy. And then there's the maintenance for the tree. So it's an ongoing cost to the city. It isn't just the capital cost to get it in the first time. It's the love and care and taking care of that, that tree for it to nurture and grow and be healthy in the neighborhood, you know, um, ad infinitum. And, and again, that's, um, uh, that's a tough nut to crack for our pavement projects when we're, we're trying to do tens of millions of dollars of really badly needed pavement work just to make the pavement safe for everyone to make sure that you know it and, and to make sure that we have pavement that's going to have a a, a, a good long uh life cycle and um and that is a, a huge focus here so street trees are important and we would love to be incorporating more of them um, i'll ask I'll ask George um, to look at it and just see if there are any areas where it might not impede uh, and might uh, might not impede, you know, drainage or cause other issues. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can explore it. Um, but again, I, I don't want to give you a false sense of hope um, because it's a it, it might be a tall order, but definitely something worthwhile to to check out. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Gina. I'd, uh, yeah, I'd love to uh, look at that. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you, Allie. Um, and we have one more hand that popped up. Brett. Brett, I'm allowing you to speak. Hi, good evening. Thank you for taking the time to do this. I apologize. I'm a, a late arrival, so I did not get to see the slides, but I will look for those on the website. So my question may have already been answered. I have two questions. The first one was, um, are any of the um, cul-de-sacs off of Garfield in the project itself, or are we just talking about Garfield proper all the way, the whole length? Yeah, I'll uh, address that one. So uh, we have uh, identified uh, the reach of uh, Garfield Drive from uh, East Washington to uh, just before across uh, Creek Street. And uh, currently we're focusing on the Garfield Drive. It's a collector, kind of like uh, Bjorn was saying earlier, the um, kind of second largest uh, street in terms of like uh, volume and uh, traffic. And um, to be able to best focus, we have basically a lot of work to do to repair our streets. And right now we're probably prioritizing streets that have more traffic on it and uh, art arterials and collectors. Thank you. And um, my, my last question is, uh, I live on Mari Lane, which is a cul-de-sac on the far north end of Garfield, the second cul-de-sac in from East Washington. And the transition from Garfield to the cul-de-sac has, it's kind of a it, well, it's unique to me. I've walked the whole stretch many times, and it's kind of like almost like a culvert that separates the uh, entrance of the cul-de-sac from the road. I'm assuming it's something to do with drainage because there aren't any storm drains there. Um, I'm wondering if that transition in the pro in the project can be updated because it's it's almost like every time you turn into the court, it's like a huge you know pothole that you sort of hit, um, even though it was prop you know purposefully done you know, back in whenever that was done last. 
Yeah, uh, so I like to address that one. And yeah, uh, going out there and seeing how it looks during the all the recent uh, rain events that we've had, um, that is uh, definitely an, an issue that I've uh, examined and identified. And um, we will be doing some uh, repair work in that area, the whole uh, kind of uh, gutter pan where the flow line for storm that's going to be rebuilt. Um, there is a lot of uplift in the drainage along that area and there's a, a lot of um we're i'm going to be doing a little bit of a sidewalk work kind of encroaching up mary to try to uh, best ad address that drainage and um uh yeah i think that's uh we're we have seen it and it is uh quite unfortunate what's, what's out there and we're going to do our best to uh, address all those uh, water issues with drainage thank you thank you very much Okay, thanks, Brett and George. And we have no more hands raised. So I think that concludes our questions and comments section. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to be here tonight and um, share your thoughts. Uh, your input is really invaluable to us. And I'll kick it back to either George or Bjorn to wrap it up. Yeah, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll uh, finish. Excuse me. Yeah, I'll uh, finish this up here and uh, just want to kind of emphasize again um, the kind of schedule that we have May. So pretty soon we'll be finishing up the utility work and we're trying to schedule the contractor as soon as possible to um, come with the uh, pavement work following right after to kind of get out of your guys' area as soon as we can and make it easier for the residents. And we're anticipating this uh, construction to be complete in the fall, winter of this year. And uh, please uh, check out the cityofpenaluma.org slash Garfield Paving. I'll be providing <clears throat> updates as we're, and as we're getting closer and have a better idea of when uh, construction will be starting. And uh, my uh, email address is below, georgehoward.cdpetaluma.org. If you have any comments or questions, concerns, if there's <clears throat> any kind of speeding areas or issues with uh, um, a sidewalk or just anything that I can do to uh, address your concerns, I would love to hear any feedback from the community. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone so much for all that feedback. It was really interesting for me learning about all the uh, cut through comments. I'm going to be um, kind of going back to the lab and thinking about different ways we can address that. And uh, I feel like Bjorn's probably already got his gears turning. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I don't uh, have anything else. So uh, thank you everyone. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it was great feedback. We really appreciate everyone's engagement in the conversation and really valuable comments. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, everybody. With that, I think I'm going to end the webinar, but um, we look forward to continuing to communicate with you around this project. All right. Thanks. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Right, thanks. Bye-bye.